Um, Her Excellency Marcia Loreiro is the Consul General of Brazil in Los Angeles, having been appointed November of 2017. She uh, earned a master's degree in foreign service from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. She has worked in science and technology, international economics, trade promotions, and parliamentary relations. She has also worked as the deputy chief of mission, or the number two diplomat, at the embassy in D.C., as well as deputy consul general of, in San Francisco. She is being hosted in Provo by Gary Nealman and his family, the honorary consul of Brazil in Salt Lake City. He and others like him volunteered with hosting Brazilians as well as performing cel- ceremonial duties. The Global Women's Studies Program has invited Her Excellency to speak on women's rights in Brazil. Please join me in in welcoming Ambassador Loreiro. Thank you for your kind introduction, and good afternoon to all. I'd like to thank the Kennedy Center for the for International Studies and the Women's Studies Program for the invitation to participate in the Global Women's Studies Colloquium. And I can congratulate in particular uh, Professor Valerie uh, Hickstrom, coordinator of the Women's Studies Program, for her work in promoting a better understanding of women's struggles and achievements. Uh, in, in current world. It is a pleasure to share with you some of the history and current challenges in the field of women's rights in Brazil. Uh, beginning with the historic context, uh, since the last years of the 19th century, um, women have mobilized in Brazil for civil, political, and social rights. Women's mobilization was then associated with the right to vote, the right to an education, and also with the abolition of slavery in a society where black women were oppressed by slavery, but white women were also oppressed by a patriarchal system. A pioneer of women's uh, right to education uh, struggle in Brazil was author and educator Nizia Floresta. She founded the first schools for girls in Brazil, and was also involved in the fight for slaves' emancipation and republicanism. We need to remember that Brazil became independent from Portugal in 1822, but was still a monarchy until 1889, when the republic was finally proclaimed. So that was a struggle that went on for most of the 19th century. Um, Soon after Brazil became a republic, a petition was sent to include women's right to vote in the, 19, the 1891 Constitution, but that first attempt did not prosper. The movement for women's suffrage gained new momentum under the leadership of a Brazilian biologist and lawyer, Bertha Lutz, who in 1922, with the support of American suffragists Carrie Chapman Catt founded the Brazilian Federation for Women's Progress, which was affiliated to the uh, International Women's Alliance. Um, And uh, as a direct consequence of the Federation's work, women's right to vote was established in a presidential decree in 1932 and later enshrined in the 1934 Constitution. Um, As for Bertha Lutz, she went on to have a prominent participation in the international arena as a delegate of Brazil, for instance, in the Inter-American Conference in Montevideo in 1933, in the International Labor Conference, which was held in Philadelphia in 1944, and in the 1945 San Francisco Conference, uh, during which she worked to ensure that the United Nations Charter preamble would include a mention to equality between men and women, and also of equality among nations. Uh, At the age of 81, decades later, in recognition of her international activity, she was invited by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to join the Brazilian delegation to the Conference of the International Women's Year in Mexico City in 1975. I still remember that, yeah. During the military regime, 
the 20 year long military regime, which was from, from 1964 to 1984, and particularly in one period when censorship set very strict limits to freedom of expression and to the debate of political and social issues, women in Brazil questioned themselves whether to direct their energy toward their specific demands or toward the broader struggle for <coughs> democracy. Should they save women or save uh, the people? And uh, which women? All of them or the most oppressed ones? Some, are, were some of their questions at their time were, were such. And then, still during the military regime, in the late 1970s and early 1980s, new actors began to appear in the Brazilian political scene, the social movements, which demanded uh, the end of the regime, of course, agrarian reform, policies for indigenous peoples, uh, and increased participation for women in the political arena. And it is within this context of new forms of, of social participation that the feminist movement which had become consolidated in the 1960s in the US and in Europe, acquires clearer contours in Brazil, especially with the momentum generated by the UN Conference of the International Women's Year, which was held in 1975, and also with the return of political exiles, politicians, intellectuals, artists, to Brazil after the amnesty law of 1979. And then in the early 80s, especially 83 and 84, a very important moment in Brazil's recent history, the broad movement of society for the return of direct elections for president created a convergence among workers' unions, student movements, academia, grassroots organizations, and within that broad um, social mobilization, the idea uh, of the creation of some structure at the federal level to specifically address women's demands also grew. And so after the end of the military regime, as a governmental response to that social aspiration and not as a governmental initiative, but as a response, the National Council on Women's Rights was created in 1985. And the important thing is this uh, structure had the participation of both government officials and representatives of society. From the international perspective, the creation of the council was in line with a recommendation of the Third Women's Conference, Nairobi, that same year. Uh, and the council became one of the first mechanisms in Latin America with a specific focus on women's rights and inspired similar initiatives in the Southern Cone, in Chile and Argentina. And then the return to a civilian government was accompanied by the election of a national constituent assembly which worked from 1987 to 88. And at that point, 26 Congresswomen, although no woman senator, worked together with the National Council in order to ensure that women's rights would ad be adequately protected and promoted in the new constitution. And I remember their activities because they, they were known as the lipstick lobby in an attempt that certainly does not escape us to associate their political efforts with the use of cosmetics and I don't know. So, but they went on and the fact is that due to their efforts, the constitution which was promulgated in 1988 enshrines equality of rights and duties for men and women, including within the the, the conjugal society is the, yeah, is that within the, the couple, incorporates provisions about women's work, the right to possession and use of land, very important for women in the rural areas, maternity leave and paternity leave. 
All that is in the Constitution. We, and, and so the new Constitution ensured gender equity and the protection of women's rights for the first time in the Brazilian Republic. In the following years, government and society had to work together increasingly to participate the country's, uh, uh, to prepare the, the country's participation in several international conferences. And I mention them because the participation of Brazil in those international events, major international conferences that were held between in, in the, the early 1990s, uh, women would attend those conferences and return to Brazil with many new ideas, with uh, new contacts, and this was a, a boost to the uh, movement for women's rights in Brazil. For instance, the, the Human Rights Conference in Vienna in 1993. Then, uh, the following year, the General Assembly of the Organization of American States, the OAS, which adopted the Inter-American Convention to prevent, punish, and eradicate violence against women. That one was held in Brazil. And then, on, in the same year, the Conference on Population and Development in Cairo, and the fourth women, uh, World Women's Conference in Beijing in 1995. Uh, and by the way, the Brazilian delegation to Beijing was headed by Dr. Ruth Cardoso, an anthropologist, wife of then President Fernando Henrique Cardoso, and another very important person in the women's rights movement in Brazil. So, as I said, Brazil's participation in that round of international conferences was a major boost to women's civil, economic, and cultural uh, rights, and also was a boost to the institution building process in the country. For example, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where I work, uh, which saw the need to create a specific department of human rights and social themes in charge of a rich agenda which includes women's issues. Until then, all these issues were treated in one department, uh, international organizations, and gradually they were uh, generating an offspring of additional departments to deal in more depth with the specific topics in the human rights and, and social agenda. And in particular, Beijing and Beijing Plus Five gave strong impulse to the next institutional advancement in Brazil, which was the creation of to, in 2002 of a Secretariat for the Rights of Women with a ministerial status. So one step up from the previous council. Um, and that illustrates the maturing of the women's movements and of their relationship with power structures. In 2003, President Lula's, Lula da Silva's first term, the secretariat was further, further strengthened and had a name change to Secretariat of Women's Policies as it is known today. Um, and the Secretariat's mission is to promote equality between men and women, to combat all forms of gender-based prejudice and discrimination in conformity with the multilateral agreements of Vienna, Cairo, and Beijing, besides the constitutional mandate itself. And here we are now in 2018. Women are 51.5% of the Brazilian population. Uh, we are now uh, 209 million people in Brazil, uh, estimated. Roughly 46% of the women self-declare as white, and 52% as black or of mixed race. These are the categories in, in the Brazilian census. But despite being the majority and having more years of schooling, women still struggle in areas such as the labor market and political life. It is true that joint efforts by the government and society have led to significant achievements. The approval of legislation against gender-based violence, specific health programs, I mean specifically designed for women, uh, initiatives to promote women's participation in the labor market and to ensure labor protection, but many challenges remain. Some of the main current issues are 
the fight against all forms of violence against women, the pay gap, increased presence in decision-making spaces, the right to natural childbirth, and many others. It's necessary to further reduce regional disparities. We have to remember that Brazil is very large and uh, the, some, uh, the regions have different degrees of development and uh, the inequality is not only a social uh, issue but also a regional one. Uh, so we need to reduce these regional disparities concerning women's education. We need to con continue the fight against gender-based stereotyping in schools, to induce actions about women in high-level positions in the corporate world and in all branches of government. And side by side with the demands of women in general, um, there are specific demands that must be identified and addressed with regard to women in their diversity young, old, belong to, belonging to the various uh, ethnic and racial groups, women with disabilities, uh, transsexual, rural workers, and women belonging to the traditional communities, such as the Quilombolas, you may have heard that word. It means the uh, communities of uh, descendants of former slaves, uh, women in rubber tapping or in small fishing communities, and it's very interesting to see the wealth of social movements representing all these different group groups and coming together uh, in a, within a broader women's rights movement. The Brazilian government seeks to implement integrated actions and to develop public policies to guarantee rights and protection to all these different segments. A very recent uh, governmental initiative was the creation of the Brazil Woman Network, which gathers government, private sector, civil society around five priority areas, which are economic autonomy, health, education, the fight against violence, and power and decision making. The network is ex expected to contribute to the implementation of the Sustainable Development Agenda of the, uh, the 2030 agenda with regard to the protection and promotion of uh, gender equality, which is the sustainable development goal number five, as you know. So if I have time, a little, a few brief words about those five priority areas. Economic autonomy, the first one. Women represent today 42.8% of the labor force in Brazil. Um, women work on average three hours more than men per week, considering a combination of paid work, housework, and care for people. And even so, in having an educational level on average higher than men's, women earn on average 76.5% of men's earnings. The fact that women devote significant time to housework or to caring for family members helps to explain why they are compelled to seek part-time jobs and this fact therefore accounts for to a large extent for the pay gap. Yeah. Other elements of explanation are the lower participation of women in management positions, only 39 percent, and the invisible barriers in the, in the corporate culture. Uh, in terms of health, one important thing to understand, uh, the context. The, in Brazil, we have a public health care system, the single health, single health system, one of the large public health systems in the world. And it offers universal and free of charge health care to the population. Uh, one major struggle is to reduce um, maternal deaths with a goal of a 50% decrease by 2030. Uh, which means from 60 to 30. Um, as in many Latin American countries, early motherhood is still a reality. Births of teenage mothers are around 17% of total births. And this is a cause of concern, especially when we take into consideration that a number of such pregnancies resulted from sexual violence against minors. It's a reality that we cannot ignore. Besides the goal of reducing maternal deaths, 
other challenges remain as responsible paternity, prevention of unwanted pregnancies, prevention of uh, STDs, infant care, uh, reduction of unnecessary C-sections. They may sound, that may sound strange here, but in Brazil they are a reality. Uh, many doctors tend to resort to a C-section instead of waiting for the natural labor uh, process. Uh, and elimination of prejudice and discrimination against vulnerable groups, such as women of African or indigenous descent, transgender, sex workers, uh, and incarcerated women. Many vulnerable groups that need special protection. In terms of education, like I said, women fare better than men in education. For example, um, around 47% of girls between 15 and 17 are enrolled in a grade which is comparable with their age, yeah? against, uh, against 63% of boys. So it goes to show uh, women, girls are being able to, to keep their education, their schooling in a better pace than, than the boys for several reasons. In universities, women are 57% of students and are 45% of professors. Um, but of course, this fi these figures show higher disparities when ethnicity and the regional distribution are taken into consideration. Among uh, the federal actions to include a gender perspective in public policies for education, I'd like to highlight the Woman and Science Program, a joint initiative. Its goals, the goals of the program are twofold. First, to encourage academic research on women's issues, uh, and, to, and also to promote the presence of women in the scientific careers. <coughs> and within this program, a very interesting project is aimed at awakening the interest of high school girls for STEM careers. Um, fight against violence. Violence against women is a problem in Brazil. It involves physical, sexual, psychological, moral, and patrimonial violence. That's how we understand the, the universe of violence. Uh, the most important legal instrument against this type of crime is, the, is a law named Maria da Penha Law. Maria da Penha was a woman who became disabled because of physical aggression by her husband, and she became a symbol of the fight for, against uh, this type of crime. Um, in 12, uh, Maria da Penha Law is of 2006. It has been uh, improved since then with additional provisions. And uh, in 2015, the Congress approved the femicide, femicide, feminicide, how would we say that in English? Uh, femicide law, uh, which includes femicide in the list of heinous crimes. That was another very important and recent uh, legislative advancement in Brazil. We should not forget the 2016 law against human trafficking, both domestic and international, which is also a very relevant legal tool for the protection of women and girls because they are the most vulnerable social segment to this type of crime and to labor and sexual exploitation. And finally, power and decision making. Underrepresentation of women in power and decision making spaces is a main challenge to us. Uh, and an increased participation of women, as well as of other underrepresented under groups, is essential to, to, to broaden the political debate on so many issues that are not being uh, adequately discussed today. Legislation was passed in 2019, 2009, in order to increase the, the number of women candidates to Congress through quotas quotas that the political parties must fulfill. However, despite some progress, parity is a distant goal. Women are 16% of senators and 11% of House representatives. We do have to work more on that. At the Supreme Court, there are currently 25% of the chief justices. And the situation is similar in the executive branch where I belong. At the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, where I come from, Women are 23% of diplomats, like myself. Many missions abroad, consulates and, and embassies and missions to, 
uh, multilateral organizations such, such as the UN and the OAS, many of those missions are now headed by women ambassadors. This is a very different reality than a decade ago. Uh, and there is a campaign which is in place to encourage women, uh, female college students to join the foreign service. This is a campaign that is going on right now. This campaign is called hashtag mais mulheres diplomatas, hashtag more women diplomats. And it is happening as we celebrate the 100th anniversary of the acceptance of the first woman uh, by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And I would like to conclude my, my presentation by remembering her, Maria Rabelo Mendes, who had to fight in the courts to be accepted and therefore opened the way to so many others of us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your presentation, Ambassador Loreto. One of the great things about being feminist is that it leads us to caring about many different issues affecting communities and women's lives throughout the world. Although many of us may never visit or live in Brazil, it is important to be educated about and ev advocates for women's rights in Brazil. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Feminism is about fighting for equality to make the world a better place for everyone. We can also learn from the experiences of women in Brazil. Many of the issues that women face in Brazil and that Ambassador Loreto discussed today are concerns that we must deal with in the US as well. For example, the pay gap, violence against women, rep limited representation of women in government, stereotyping and discrimination, and so on. Although cultures and results may differ, we can look at the practices and strategies that work in one country and explore whether they will work in another. And now Courtney will lead the Q&A so we can gain more insights from Ambassador Loda. Good afternoon. We have about 15 minutes now where we will have the opportunity to ask Her Excellency questions pertaining to women's rights in Brazil. Our first question is how can we as residents of the United States learn more about the circumstances of women in Brazil and apply it to our own society? You're gonna go one by one? Mm -hmm. um, who, who, who asked the question? Me. You, yourself? <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, I think um, the international media, of course, is a very relevant tool, but uh, these days we, we have this social media and the internet as a powerful source of, ed of information and of opinion. And uh, so I encourage you to, to use those media to get better in, in, informed and involved, I'd say also involved with the social uh, women, women's movements in, in Brazil. Um, one of the issues that I learned while preparing the presentation was the, the, the situation of maternal deaths. I thought it was a particularity of, of Brazil. Uh, and I realized it is also something that is a problem in the United States. The United States is also struggling to reduce maternal deaths, right? Uh, uh, within the sustainable development goals and all. So you see, uh, so sometimes you find surprising similarities in the, in the struggles, right? And this is very important. Uh, many of you go to Brazil, right, or have been to Brazil as missionaries and uh, in the por Portuguese program, are learning Portuguese and preparing to, to return to Brazil. So I do encourage you to learn more about these things whenever you have a, uh, an opportunity of getting in touch with Brazilians or visiting Brazil to try and learn more about these issues and uh, Offer your academic training here in the United States and uh, experiences uh, of, uh, in terms of a community organization uh, that you may have witnessed or participated in because the United States is really uh, 
a pioneer in so many areas in terms of uh, community organization and also I do think you have a lot of experience to share with us and uh, not only Brazil but uh, emerging countries and uh, uh, Latin American countries in general and we will certainly uh, learn and benefit from your experience. Besides that, there is also the international, the multilateral organizations in Geneva, in New York, and in the uh, Organization of American States. All of those organizations have very strong, uh, well-established structures for the treatment of uh, these issues, women's issues, for instance, and they are also another fora, forum for the exchange of ideas and best practices and uh, uh, for the improvement of general guidelines for, for the whole hemisphere. Thank you. Now we'll open it up for you all to ask questions. Yes, back in the corner. Um, you mentioned that there is a tension, especially as you frame this issue, between women who felt that they advocate for democracy during the military regime and women who are fighting for women's rights. Can you talk a little bit more about how they reconcile those two ideas and if you agree with that belief? Okay. Yeah, that was very interesting. You see, and, and that's something that women that participated in, in that struggle du during those years often mention, how they were torn at sometimes between these two sets of, uh, of questions. Um, the, the, the fight for democracy in Brazil itself ended up pulling those groups together. They realized that you cannot have one thing without the other. Uh, a struggle just for women's rights dissociated from the broader struggle for democracy and social rights uh, would not go anywhere. Uh, women understood that. Men did too, but I think uh, women in understood that more quickly. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, they finally realized that you could not have one struggle uh, aside from the other. They could not be separated. Yeah. We would like to invite those with questions to come up to this microphone over here so that we might all be able to hear you better. Um, do we have a next question? Yes, thank you. Muito obrigado. All right, so my question, this is very tall for me. Sitting on my tiptoes. Okay, what kinds of resources in terms of uh, books, websites, pamphlets, other things like that, are available uh, for people to learn about women's rights in Brazil? So any kind of website, any kind of something like that that people can go to for additional information? Okay. Yeah, I would, I would begin with the website of the Women's Secretariat for, the Secretariat for Women's Policies. Uh, it should be spm.gov.br. Secretaria de Políticas para Mulheres. I think that's the main resource. The, the, the departing point, which we will direct you to other, to other sites and to other sources of, uh, of research. Okay. Secretaria de Políticas para Mulheres. That's the current name of the women Secretariat for Women's Policies. It should. You should have something departing from there. You should be able to, to find other, your way to other sites. Yes. Um, I have two questions for you. Um, one, what kinds of issues do indigenous women face today? Mm -hmm. And what protections exist for indigenous women in Brazil? Just this, uh, as we ha were having lunch, we were discussing how the indigenous issue in Brazil is such a thorny issue, uh, and uh, there are uh, specific programs for for women for in indigenous women in women in Brazil. Uh, one problem is that indigenous the indigenous population in in itself is very diverse. You cannot apply the same perspective, the same policies to different ethnic groups in the northeast, in the north, in the southern uh, part of Brazil. The indigenous groups among themselves are very diverse. Um, I think uh, mother and infant care are a problem. Very difficult sometimes to reach these communities. Right now, for instance, we have a problem with uh, measles, uh, a disease that we hadn't heard of in Brazil for many years and now has returned 
because of the Venezuelan migration crisis. People coming from Venezuela to Brazil, and they are not arriving fully immunized. They are bringing diseases that we had we, we didn't have anymore. And, and that is an area where we do have a, a large indigenous population. So health and, and, and child, uh, modern child health is a problem, education, and I think violence against women is also something uh, widespread and difficult to handle because then there are cultural components that must be better understood and, and dealt with and the indigenous culture is not homogeneous. The groups vary among themselves, so it makes it a, an even bigger challenge. So just to return to the idea of um, women's rights being kind of pushed aside in the interest of more important or more pressing or broader issues, um, I've seen this as uh, retort I get when I say I, I'm very passionate about women's rights that, well, those aren't the only rights that matter. So how do you suggest we resolve that conflict and try to move forward together attacking all issues? But do you still see it as a, a dichotomy? Do you still see it as a, a women separating their, their struggle from the broader struggle of the social I don't, yeah. but I have a hard time. I, I do, I recognize that um, women's rights often uplift many different um, demographics that are marginalized and, and having issues, um, LGBTQ issues and, and poverty and children and, and the disabled. Um, but how do you suggest we more clearly communicate that idea to other people who don't understand? I don't have a suggestion about that other than talk and talk and talk and, and make it known as, mu as much as we can. Uh, um, engage men in our struggles, uh, engage fathers and, and, and sons and, and professors and to bring, uh, to make it seen by men that it, that's a struggle that benefits them as well. Uh, anything in the, for instance, a, a, a policy towards uh, mothers. It does not benefit only the mother, it benefits the family as a whole. And more than the family, it's in the interest of society that we have uh, stable families, right? It's not just a, uh, an interest of a woman, as it is sometime under, sometimes understood. Women are, are not fighting only for themselves when they uh, have uh, present some demands. They are fighting for something that will benefit themselves, their families, and society as a whole. M motherhood has a social role, not only a role within a family, right? Because it is in the interest of everybody to have kids well taken care of, uh, stable, uh, psychologically healthy, right? So if we are able to pass the message, to transmit the message that our struggles are not only in our own benefit, but in the benefit of society as a whole, uh, I think we'll be more successful in engaging men always, I think. I think that's very important. Thank you. I don't think we have time for more. Sorry. Unfortunately, that is all we have time for today. Thank you for your questions and your participation. We would like to thank Ambassador Luero for her insights and her time today, and I ask that you would join me in a round of applause.